Okay, we've reached the half hour mark, so let's get started. Welcome everyone to this week's installment of AMSM's National Fellows Online Lecture Series. My name is Matt Wise. I'm an assistant professor in family medicine and orthopedics at UD Southwestern. Before we get into our topic for tonight, I want to remind everyone for next week's lecture on acute atraumatic shoulder pain, which will be given by Dr. Jason Zaremski one week from today at the same time. Moving on to tonight, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Alberto Oseguera to speak to us on common H-E-E-N-T conditions and management in athletes. Dr. Oseguera graduated medical school from the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston and then completed his family medicine residency at Christa Santa Rosa uh, prior to doing his sports medicine fellowship at the University of Washington. He is now an assistant professor at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio. In addition, he has served as the head physician for Purdue football. Before we get started, we also like to mention the goals of the National Fellow Online Lecture Series, which are to serve as an adjunct to your individual program's educational content, to provide fellows with direct access to educational experiences with AMSSM members and at times invited guest experts, and to assist in CAQ exam preparation. And lastly, some reminders to please mute your device's microphone and turn off your video, submit questions to the chat function, I'll ask the questions during the Q&A session at the end, and then please complete the evaluation at the end of the lecture, which will likely be sent out by Andy. Um, and now, without further ado, welcome Dr. Oseguera. Sweet, thanks Matt. I uh, appreciate the uh, invite and uh, thanks to AMSSM for letting me uh, talk to you guys a little bit about HEENT uh, -E and some of the things that <clears throat> you may encounter during your practice as a sports med physician. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my slides here. Also, uh, I want to congratulate as well all the new fellows that just uh, matched today. Uh, so hopefully that uh, is a exciting day for, for everybody uh, involved in that. So congrats to all those people. All right, let me see if I can figure this one out here. Does that look, does that look good there? Look, looks like how we practiced. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Practice makes perfect, clearly. Um, all right. So um, like I said, uh, we'll be going over some common H-E-E-N-T uh, -E -E conditions and some uh, management uh, in athletics and the athletic population. So I'm uh, currently at UT Health San Antonio in their uh, <clears throat> primary care center doing both family practice and sports medicine. Um, helping out a little bit with UTSA athletics and uh, the community uh, in San Antonio. So that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I don't have any uh, relevant disclosures for the lecture, um, so we can go ahead and uh, get started. So um, <clears throat> H-E-E-N-T uh, obviously involves the, the head, ears, eyes, nose, and throat. So this is just kind of a basic schematic of the relevant anatomy that we'll kind of be reviewing. Um, as you can see uh, in the picture, there's obviously many possible areas of injury and involvement in disease processes. So um, we won't have time to obviously cover everything, but we'll try to get through some high yield items and hopefully have time for some questions at the end. Um, so a little bit about uh, epidemiology. So facial trauma um, in, in sport is actually very common. It counts, accounts for about 20% of all sports injuries and up to half of all maxillofacial traumas. So this is something you'll incorporate or you will see if you um, do sideline medicine and of course in clinic for follow-ups. Overall, there has been an overall decrease in incidents, and that's largely due to some rule changes that have taken place, uh, improved equipment, and uh, as with anything, if you bring awareness and education to a certain topic, which um, AMSSM and other sports uh, providers before me have done, there's obviously going to be an overall decrease in incidents. But as long as there's going to be sport, there's going to be trauma, and uh, that's where we kind of come in to try to help. So basic exam, um, as with any exam, you'll obviously wanna do some inspection, uh, evaluate for any sort of deformity of the area, bruising or swelling that could be involved. You definitely wanna palpate the uh, focused area uh, to evaluate for any sort of swelling, crepitus, which could indicate a possible underlying fracture, 
fluctuance um, or induration, which could indicate an infection and any soft tissue masses that um, are either from trauma or um, of a malignant etiology. Um, <clears throat> when we go through each system, you obviously want to evaluate each system individually based on what the chief complaint is. So um, going over eyes, nose, ears, um, oropharynx, and with any sort of maxillofacial or facial or head trauma, you're definitely going to want to do a very thorough neuro exam um, that includes evaluation of all your cranial nerves. And I'll uh, leave that for a separate uh, topic. So again, we'll start with the head and face. Anytime there's trauma to the head and the face, um, you really want to rule out any sort of major trauma. So any sort of uh, traumatic brain injury, C-spine injury, um, neurologic uh, involvement, and you uh, want to evaluate <clears throat> your ABCs or CAB as they call it now. So um, any sort of uh, cardiovascular event that could occur, you want to evaluate airway and then uh, um, breathing, of course, as well. And initiate any sort of emergency action plan, of course, if, if it's indicated for any of these uh, traumatic events. So we'll first start off with a uh, discussion about some lacerations, which is going to be super common. Um, I will say uh, to uh, all of you young learners that really um, only repair lacerations that you really feel comfortable repairing. Most of these are gonna involve the face. So if there's any sort of cosmetic deformity um, and you don't feel comfortable with that, then obviously um, make that aware. And usually the athletes are okay with that. Um, and most of these lacerations can be um, fixed in, in less than 24 hours, as long as there's appropriate like irrigation and cleaning. So um, if you see something that happens uh, on the sideline and you just don't feel comfortable, know that um, it's possible to delay that and get, you know, either plastic surgery involved or ENT um, to, you know, allow for a good cosmetic uh, repair. So along those lines, the primary repair is usually the preferred treatment for facial lacerations. And again, this can involve either the forehead, the eyebrow, eyelid, nose, the cheek um, and any sort of intraoral lesion can obviously get lacerated. Um, and then the tongue is also a potential uh, possibility for laceration. Like I mentioned, anything um, <clears throat> that is fixed within 24 hours is actually low risk for infection, as long as during the initial evaluation, it's thoroughly cleaned and irrigated and um, covered to prevent infection. For uh, some of you guys that maybe aren't familiar with the different type of suturing uh, items, we usually pick uh, 5-0 or 6-0 types of um, sutures, and that's just determined on the size. There's a bunch of different sizes. Uh, the small or the larger the number, the smaller the needle size is. So 5-0 or 6-0 is going to be pretty. Is going to be really good for the face. And usually for children, 6-0 is going to be preferable. And that's just uh, due to increased tensile strength of the suture. And uh, with the non-absorbable sutures, there's actually a less inflammatory response, which is why we actually prefer non-absorbable su sutures uh, on the face. The different types of sutures would be nylon, uh, polypropylene, or polybutester. And those are just the different types of material that's used to make the suture. The type of repair would be simple interrupted is usually preferred. There's a bunch of different suturing techniques. We usually don't recommend continuous uh, sutures for the face. One, because sometimes they can dehiss and just lead to a poor cosmetic outcome. But um, usually if uh, simple interrupted is fine. There's also like vertical or horizontal mattress sutures that can also be used, but again, those just sometimes lead to poor cosmetic response. <clears throat> when you're looking at the different sutures, these are all the uh, different items on the actual suture. So when I was mentioning the, uh, <clears throat> can you actually see my mouse or no? Yeah, okay. So here's the different labeling. So 5-0 or 6-0 is gonna be what you're looking for. And then this is the material. 
that um, you'll want to look for as well to make sure it's absorbable. And then there's different needle types, there's different needle length. Um, it'll have a picture of the needle. This is where you want to grab the needle. You'll definitely want to make sure it's not expired. So after every season, it'll be important to go through all your sutures and all your equipment to make sure that things haven't expired and you don't need to re restock your, your pack. But this is essentially what all of your sutures will, will kind of look like for the majority uh, of the time. Important with lacerations that patients are up to date with their tetanus. If not, then they may require a booster of their tetanus vaccines. That'll depend on their prior immune status as well as the, the type of wound they sustained. If they've had the completion of their immu immunizations, which most people here in the States do, then as long as they've been vaccinated within the last five years, um, all they really need is the, the tetanus vaccine. If they haven't completed the, the tetanus series when they were younger, or it's a really infected wound, then sometimes they would require uh, the tetanus vaccine as well as the, uh, <clears throat> the tetanus immunoglobulin. So that'll be important to ask when you're evaluating these patients. For most lacerations that are not animal or human bites, you really don't need antibiotic prophylaxis. I know a lot of times this can be done just to make kind of us feel better, but uh, clinically speaking, that's not really indicated. And it, as long as you have close follow-up with the patient, then there's no need to start prophylactic antibiotics. Of course, for animal or human bites, um, Augmentin is going to be the, the the drug of choice. And I usually remember that with uh, dog mentin, and that's kind of how my uh, mentors told me to remember that one. So uh, Augmentin is usually the drug of choice. For anything involving the lip, um, those usually uh, will, will require referral to a more specialized, uh, either ENT or plastics. Uh, just if they're kind of full thickness tears of the lip, if they're irregularly shaped or they involve the actual muscle or the vermilion border, those just require a lot more, uh, I think, skill in repairing those, just more for cosmetic deformities and especially if it involves the muscle and it's not sutured appropriately, that can lead to long-term issues with like chewing and definitely leave a cosmetic deformity with like smiling that sometimes we take for granted. So it'll be important if that's the case and get those uh, patients referred to the appropriate uh, subspecialist. Um, moving on to skull fractures. So there's a lot of different bones that can be involved when thinking about skull fractures. To actually fracture the skull, this usually requires severe or significant trauma. So it'll be important, again, to activate EAP if indicated and to look for your um, uh, signs of any sort of emergency uh, that <clears throat> may need to be uh, addressed prior to just a simple skull fracture. The typical presentation uh, will be usually headaches, uh, confusion, loss of consciousness, but not always vomiting, blurred vision, swelling or bruising around the eyes, which is very specific for a certain type of fracture. And uh, if there's involvement of the facial nerve in certain fractures, you can get some paralysis or weakness of the facial area. Um, it will, looking at most of these symptoms, um, you can kind of see a lot of overlap with like a basic uh, or simple concussion. So it'll be important when you do evaluate somebody that has a concussion that you do serial exams and make sure there aren't any progression of symptoms that maybe could indicate an underlying skull fracture uh, or uh, a, a secondary injury of the brain. So again, with uh, the just a con normal concussion evaluation, it'll be important to do those serial exams. The textbook um, <clears throat> battle sign uh, for uh, skull fractures and raccoon eyes. So battle sign is this kind of bruising that you'll get right behind the ear. It can be on one or both sides. And that's pretty uh, specific for these basal or skull fractures, along with raccoon eyes, where you kind of get this bruising underneath both, uh, both of the eyes. So that's pretty high yield uh, and pretty specific for these 
those specific type of skull fractures. Most of these skull fractures, if not all, will require neuro neurosurgical consultation, not only for uh, management, but also for clearance and return to play. So it'll definitely be important to have a team-based approach with management of these uh, conditions. So as I talked about, there are different types of skull fractures. You can get these linear fractures where they're actually pretty stable. There's not much shifting of the bone, um, but still require neurosurgical evaluation. You can get these depressed fractures, which are usually more from blunt force trauma, from high speed impact, either from like a baseball or um, uh, just another body part. And that can lead to uh, injury to the brain as well. So subdural epidural hematomas. So again, those serial exams are going to be super important. These, uh, these types of fractures are more common in kids. So you don't really need to worry about those uh, for kids or pediatric populations that have already closed the sutures. And then this basilar fracture that we talked about with the raccoon eyes and the battle sign. Moving on uh, to the to the ear. So one of the most common things that you'll see in combat sports is something called auricular hematoma. And that is uh, essentially a collection of blood within the cartilaginous uh, part of the ear. So the ear has uh, different forms or different areas of cartilage. And that is the helix, the anti-helix, uh, the concha or concha, uh, the, the tragus, and then the anti-tragus. With combat sports like wrestling, boxing, MMA, usually you can also see it in rugby. When you get direct trauma to the area, you kind of separate the subperichondral space and you get accumulation of, of blood, which results in a hematoma. Um, it'll be important to try to aspirate those as quickly as you can, because if you have this uh, hematoma that just goes untreated, you can end up with a cosmetic deformity and that's that cauliflower ear. So auricular, auricular hematoma and cauliflower ear are not the same thing. They're essentially, a, uh, uh, they're not interchangeable. Cauliflower ear is the sequela of an auricular hematoma that goes untreated. And that is usually from decreased perfusion, which will lead to necrosis that then leads to cartilage loss. And then you get this fibrosis, uh, granulation tissue formation, and then you get again this cosmetic deformity. It'll be uh, again important to drain as soon as possible. If anything uh, over seven days presents to your clinic, at that point it might be important to refer, just because that uh, hematoma has probably already started to organize and form some granulation tissue. The different approaches to treatment would be either a needle aspiration. With an 18 gauge needle, you can do an incision and drainage, um, or sometimes you can do an IV catheter evacuation where you insert that 18 gauge IV catheter and then just cut the tip of the plastic and let that uh, hematoma drain. The important thing after the aspiration is that you apply a compressive dressing. If you don't apply the compressive dressing, you're just putting that ear at higher risk for reaccumulation of blood and reformation of the hematoma. So all your hard work went, went, to no, went for nothing. Um, if that does happen, then you can try to re-aspirate, but at that point, it might be better to do more uh, aggressive like incision and drainage if you didn't try that the initial, during the initial aspiration. Um, <clears throat> prophylactic antibiotic for this is a little um, uh, controversial. Some uh, authors say they do, some say they don't. I think if you have close follow-up with your athletes, so if you have like a training room clinic and you'll see them on a regular basis, you can probably hold off on antibiotics. But if you know, you're just seeing them at, for the first time and the follow-up isn't going to be very close, it may be worth starting prophylactic antibiotics just because that collection of fluid uh, is a nidus for infection. And uh, again, if you don't keep it clean and you don't follow them closely, you don't want to miss an infection in the area, which then leads to a bunch of other issues. And then the most important thing to prevent this is going to be appropriate headgear. So for wrestling, uh, this is the normal type of headgear that you would wear. It for some reason seems to fall off uh, pretty frequently with wrestlers. And for whatever reason, they just don't want to put it back on. It probably just uh, disrupts their ability to train or 
I don't, I don't know why they don't regularly wear their headgear, but um, at least in, in a lot of institutions I've been at, they kind of just don't uh, like to wear it. It seems uh, interesting and you provide all the education you want, but for whatever reason, they sometimes just don't like it. With uh, Olympic boxing, they actually do require this headgear to be worn. So uh, a lot of times in training sessions, boxers will wear this um, to try to, one, obviously try to prevent head injury, but it can be a protective mechanism for formation of the hematoma. And then this is a typical headgear worn in rugby players that with scrums, you usually get a lot of uh, rubbing up against each other and uh, trauma to the ear. So that'll be something that uh, can prevent this. Uh, tympanic membrane rupture is also quite common, and this can have different etiologies. Um, it can be from direct trauma to the ear or to the ear area. It can be from an infection such as otitis media, or it can be a result from barotraumas uh, when you're either when you're um, diving. So patients will usually present with severe pain and vertigo, and that vertigo is usually just due to the vestibular dysfunction that occurs from the changes in pressure and the changes that occur in the middle ear from just it being exposed. Most of the time, these will hear, heal spontaneously and rarely do they require treatment um, unless the amount of perforation is so, is so large and they're having either recurrent infections or persistent vertigo, then they can patch that up uh, or ENT can patch it up and treat, treat it that way. If the perforation is due to an infection, it'll be super important to avoid any aminoglycoside preparations. That uh, is just due to the ototoxicity that can occur from those types of antibiotics. So neomycin polymyxin B is a very common uh, otic antibiotic that's used for ear infections. If you can't rule out a ear uh, tympanic membrane perforation, then it'll be important to avoid that. Once, um, <clears throat> once that uh, this, the vertigo um, or the vestibular dysfunction is healed, most of the time you can return to athletic participation. If the athletes are involved in aquatic sports, then it'll be very important for them to um, <clears throat> wear earplugs, and those can be custom made with ENT and definitely a tight fitting cap to avoid uh, the fluid coming into the ear to, uh, again, give higher risk of infection. But most of the time, if they're not involved in aquatic sports, once their uh, vestibular dysfunction is improved, obviously on exam, then they can return to sport really without any issue. So a little bit about uh, barotrauma. This isn't uh, super high yield, but with diving medicine, um, I actually had a patient that was uh, the other day that needed to be cleared for diving. So it is something that uh, is seen in clinic, just not very commonly. So I figured I would incorporate it because I thought it was kind of interesting. The, the main mechanism that occurs is just from the inability to uh, equalize the pressure in the ear. And it usually occurs during descent. So again, um, you'll, <clears throat> it is due to the failure to compensate and equal, equalize the water pressure in the middle ear the trauma will present with uh, pain, they'll have the vertigo, tinnitus, and usually will have conductive hearing loss. The different signs and symptoms, will, you'll have uh, tympanic membrane injection or redness, you can have tympanic membrane rupture, or you can have blood accumulation behind the eardrum. Treatment for this, uh, decongestants is going to be mainstay of treatment, so oral antihistamines, Sometimes you can use uh, intranasal corticosteroids, and then you'll want to refrain from diving until this is fully recovered. Different ways to try to prevent this is uh, performing the Valsalva maneuver during descent. You don't want to, uh, you do want to caution patients or people who are going diving that if you do excessive Valsalva maneuvers, you could actually make things worse. So um, trying not to, over exaggerate the Valsalva maneuver because you can't actually create barotrauma just from that. And then you want to definitely slow, have a slow descent and definitely plenty of practice and training to ensure that this doesn't happen. Um, you can also pre-dive, you can kind of prophylactically treat with uh, nasal or systemic decongestants. 
So this is just a picture of the uh, injected tympanic membrane. So you can see some of the redness that uh, is essentially just uh, some microvasculature <clears throat> rupture. This is, again, another picture of that uh, injected tympanic membrane with the uh, blood behind the tympanic membrane. So that's going to be important during your exam to uh, evaluate for. The other common, uh, or not common, but other thing you can see with diving is inner ear decompression sickness. So you have multiple decompression sicknesses, but you can also get it involving your inner ear, which you will usually occur during rapid ascent. And that is just due to gas bubble formation in the inner ear. Usually they don't present with pain. Most of the time they'll present with the vertigo, the nystagmus, tinnitus, and then nausea and vomiting, again, just from that gas formation and uh, more severe dizziness that they'll feel. Mainstay of treatment for decompression sickness will be hyperbaric oxygen therapy, but you'll really want to do a good exam and take a good history because if uh, they actually have middle ear barotrauma, it's contraindicated uh, to do hyperbaric oxygen therapy because uh, there have been reports of barotrauma being caused by hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So it'll be important to try to uh, distinguish between the two pathologies or else you can actually make things uh, worse. And pain is usually going to be the uh, the main factor uh, with that. And again, if they don't have the uh, the blood in the uh, middle ear or the injection of the tympanic membrane, usually steers you away from any sort of barotrauma and more of an inner ear decompression issue. Um, ear infections. This is common in your general population, so it's definitely going to be common in your athletic population. Um, there's different types of ear infections. The two most common is going to be your otitis media or your middle ear infection and your otitis externa, your external ear infection, also known as swimmer's ear. The um, mainstay of treatment is going to be antibiotics. Again, like I mentioned earlier, it's going to be super important to try to evaluate the ear to make sure that there isn't any sort of perforation of the eardrum because that'll definitely change your, your management. The Treatment for otitis externa, usually for mild cases, uh, acetic acid hydrocortisone can be used for about seven days. And once the infection is cleared, they can return to activity and sport. Just make sure that again, that infection is healed and they um, wear a tight fitting cap or earplugs to try to prevent recurrent infections. If they do have a tympanic membrane rupture, or you can't actually see the tympanic membrane, then you would want to do either ciprodrex, ciprodex or um, ofloxacin eardrops, again, just because that neomycin can be ototoxic. For the otitis media, that's usually going to be unilateral associated with ear pain, decreased or muffled hearing. They'll have what's called a bulge tympanic membrane. And uh, if uh, excuse me, treatment will be Augmentin 875, uh, 125, twice a day for about five to seven days. If it's a severe otitis media infection, then you can extend that to about 10 days. But same thing, once they are afebrile, if they don't participate in aquatic sports, then most of these patients can return to sport once they start feeling better. If the tympanic membrane is ruptured for otitis media, you can consider topical antibiotics Usually I just do oral antibiotics and they, they seem to do fine. And again, that ruptured tympanic membrane can heal uh, spontaneously or on its own. The <clears throat> otitis externa. So this is all just uh, infl inflammation in the external auditory canal with some purulence that you can see in that area. The uh, bulge tympanic membrane. So you'll see um, this kind of white discoloration, you won't see that classic like triangle that we see uh, when we're looking at the, the normal eardrum. And then you can see some air fluid levels as well. And that's just purulent fluid that's accumulated in the middle ear and will need to either be evacuated and treated with uh, the antibiotics. So surfer's ear is, again, not very common and not something that's uh, explored too much in the literature, but it's an external auditory canal 
exostosis, and it's caused due to uh, persistent exposure to cold water. So what happens is you get this reactive hyperemia in the external auditory canal due to that cold water, which for whatever reason seems to stimulate osteoclasts in the periosteum and will lead to bone formation in the external auditory canal. So most of the time they won't cause issues, especially if they're small, but if they're pretty large, then they can impede normal drainage of the auditory canal, which will then lead to infection. Um, if they do present with symptoms, again, usually we'll have muffled hearing, hearing loss, um, or recurrent ear infections. For these small exostosis, you can uh, just observe. If they're super large or they're just causing recurrent issues, then surgery will need to be um, discussed to try to, uh, to try to remove them, essentially. And to try to prevent these, again, earplugs, um, tight-fitting bodysuits for surfers or people who do um, water sports will be um, important. And this is kind of what they look like. So there are these little growths that you get uh, in this external auditory canal. And this one definitely has a, an infection associated with it. So this is definitely small. I think if there's just one of this, probably okay to just watch. But for these bigger ones, it looks like, again, with the infection, it'd be worth talking to ENT to get them removed. So moving on to uh, nasal fractures, super common in sport. They account for about 40% of all facial bone fractures. Again, with any sort of facial fracture, you'll want to uh, evaluate for any sort of secondary traumas or um, more life-threatening conditions. Most of the time, they'll involve the actual bone, but they can also involve the cartilage as the nasal bridge is both bony and cartilaginous. The management usually uh, involves simple reduction and control of any sort of bleeding that'll, that'll happen. If you feel comfortable reducing them and you've kind of ruled out secondary, more uh, aggressive uh, <clears throat> issues, then you can try to reduce it immediately. But uh, if you just don't feel comfortable, just know that it can uh, be reduced after a couple days. Usually that's sometimes what people do once the swelling has gone down, reevaluate in like three or four days and try to reduce. Most of the time imaging is not necessary. Usually you sometimes can't even see the fracture or um, you'll see other things and just um, again, imaging just sometimes isn't too helpful unless you're concerned for second uh, secondary issues, then you'll want to get more dedicated CT scan or, or whatever it may be to try to rule out the, the secondary issue. With all nasal fractures, it'll be important to evaluate for a septal hematoma. That's essentially just a collection of fluid uh, within the nasal cavity that forms this, uh, again, hematoma in the septum. The It'll be important if you do see this to uh, to try to drain it. I personally haven't drained one. So uh, referring this to ENT would probably be something that uh, would you would recommend. Again, they can just drain it pretty easily and then they'll pack it with antibiotic uh, uh, containing um, packing material to try to prevent infection. You don't wanna miss this because if you let the septal hematoma go, then it'll create necrosis of the, the septum and can lead to a saddle nose deformity. And uh, that's what that will look like. So you kind of get this, uh, instead of the normal nasal bridge here, um, you'll get necrosis of the, the cartilaginous tissue, and then you'll get this uh, deformity here of the, of the bridge of the nose. So most of the time, uh, again, if you are able to reduce it, you've ruled out any sort of concussion or other secondary issues. Most patients can return to play pretty immediately, um, just knowing that, they either can uh, damage it further and they're okay kind of accepting that risk. If you happen to have a face mask available in your kit or your athletic trainer has one, that's something that can also be used in the interim to try to uh, allow them to return to play um, in a kind of timely fashion. If they ultimately do decide to undergo surgical repair, either because they wanted to delay any sort of uh, reorientation of the fracture or reduction of the fracture, or the fracture was just so displaced you couldn't reduce it, then it'll be important to uh, protect that uh, nose post-op 
with a face mask, usually for about six weeks, but that can be dictated more by ENT, more to just again, decrease risk of further injury. All right, uh, nosebleeds, again, super common in sport. Uh, you have two different areas where that nosebleed could be arising from, from the anterior or the posterior uh, nose. The anterior uh, is called this uh, caselback or caselback plexus. And then the posterior would be this Woodruff plexus. Um, most of the time with nosebleeds, for whatever reason, most uh, people have a tendency to kind of lean back, but you actually don't want to do that because you'll start swallowing the blood and you can aspirate and have uh, other issues. So what you want to do is actually encourage the athlete to lean forward and try to um, cover one side of the nostril and try to evacuate uh, some of the, the blood there. Or if it's uh, clotted already, that'll help kind of evacuate the, the uh, blood clots. Again, you can kind of pack these either with um, gauze. Usually most athletic trainers on the sideline have a nasal tampon. Um, if for whatever reason it doesn't want to stop bleeding, sometimes you can add some nasal phenylephrine, essentially a vasoconstrictor to try to uh, control the bleeding uh, until you uh, can kind of evaluate further. Um, once the bleeding stops, they're able to return to play um, as long, again, as it's not a posterior uh, <clears throat> bleed, because if it is a posterior bleed, that'll definitely warrant uh, an ENT evaluation in the emergency room. And that usually presents with other symptoms. Most uh, notably, they can uh, have some nausea. They can actually be throwing up some of that blood. Um <clears throat> Uh, and again, they just, it'll be a more traumatic type of event, but most of the time it'll be these anterior nosebleeds that usually just get controlled with packing and uh, Rhino Rocket is kind of the brand name of some of these uh, things that most athletic trainers have in, in their pack. Oops. Um, <clears throat> moving on to the eye, there's a bunch of eye uh, pathologies. So I kind of just picked a few that I think are, are fairly high yield and um, uh, can be talked about uh, pre pretty quickly. So one of the most common things will be this uh, subconjunctival hemorrhage. Essentially, it's just um, little ruptures of some of the small blood vessels in the eye can be caused by trauma. Most of the time they're spontaneous and uh, they can, they're, they actually are more common in contact lens wearers. Most of the time patients will come in complaining of this red spot on their eye. They say they woke up and their eye was red and they don't really know why. Um, you really uh, want to evaluate for any underlying serious causes. So if they did have trauma, you want to rule out any sort of orbital fracture, globe fracture, if they have uncontrolled high blood pressure, that's a reason that this can happen. Um, <clears throat> if they uh, have some underlying bleeding disorder, they'll usually have presented earlier in age for this. So in the pediatric population, this may be more common with coagulopathies. But if you see somebody in their 30s or 40s and have ever had an issue, that's probably a lot less likely. There really is no uh, treatment for this. It'll just self-resolve after, after a couple of weeks. Um, it's just really providing reassurance and athletes can uh, continue to participate and uh, really won't have much of an issue as long as there's no secondary cause. Uh, a more traumatic uh, red eye would be something called a hyphema. This is bleeding in this anterior chamber of the eye. So this is kind of a classic picture for it mostly happens from blunt force trauma damaging the microvasculature of the iris. They'll present with pain, swelling, blurred vision. They'll have some pupillary changes with uh, reactive to the light, um, occasionally, not always. And this is definitely something that'll require urgent ophthalmology evaluation. In the meantime, you can provide a rigid eye shield. You'll want to provide some bed rest. And then if there are any sort of anti-inflammatories for musculoskeletal conditions, you'll Definitely want to stop those just for increased risk of, of, uh, of bleeding. If for whatever reason they're on anticoagulation medicine, it'll be important to discuss that with the hematologist, hematologist 
if they have one, just to discuss risks and benefits of stopping any sort of anticoagulation. Um, because again, you know, that can obviously have its its other issues. Um, a little bit about conjunctivitis. This is super common. Uh, there's multiple reasons why people can show up for the their red eye, uh, as we already talked about a couple. The three most common forms of conjunctivitis are going to be allergic conjunctivitis, viral or bacterial. Majority of the time, this is going to be viral in nature. We'll usually present with unilateral changes with some uh, discharge. Bi uh, bilateral uh, <clears throat> conjunctivitis is most likely a um, <clears throat> uh, allergic type of conjunctivitis, and they'll present with other si signs of allergies like congestion, cough, things like that. So um, bacterial is actually not as common as we, I think, treat for. Um, that usually is like a copious amount of uh, discharge of the eye. Um, for younger athletes um, or college age kids, definitely want to rule out any sort of STIs. Um, gonorrhea, chlamydia can present as bacterial conjunctivitis. But I'll, I'll say, I think we definitely overtreat uh, conjunctivitis with antibiotics, mainly just that's kind of uh, the nature of the game sometimes. So I think education to the patients, to the athletic trainers, letting it kind of ride its course. And what I usually do in these situations um, is I'll give them the antibiotic ointment or drops or whatever we're going to use. And if it's not better in like three or four days, or if they're going on a trip, then usually um, we can let the, uh, you know, leave it up to the discretion of the athlete to start the antibiotic ointments if it's not better after a couple of days. But most of the time, it'll just go away without any sort of treatment. Um, these are just some pictures from up to date that I thought were um, pretty helpful. So bacterial, again, you'll have this copious uh, purulent discharge. Viral, you'll have some like watery discharge um, and you kind of clean it off and it usually will go away, but after a couple hours, it may come back. Uh, allergic, again, just kind of like uh, <clears throat> you'll get scratchy eyes and you'll have these other upper respiratory issues. Um, kind of already talked about that and talked about that. So treatment um, will usually be with antibiotic. Again, the bacterial ones you can treat with antibiotic ointments. Um, trimethoprim, uh, polymyxin B, you can do one to two drops for about five to seven days. It should be fine. If they do wear contact lenses, I would avoid the polytrim and uh, do uh, ofloxacin or ciprofloxacin just for the uh, pseudomonas type coverage. And uh, again, that's only for contact lens wearers because they do have increased risk of, of pseudomonas infection. Corneal abrasion. Uh, so <clears throat> again, this is not terribly common, but is something that you might come across. What will usually happen is patients will complain of this foreign body sensation in their eye, like they're trying to scratch their eye and they just can't seem to get rid of it. They'll complain of uh, irritation with light or just continuous tearing. And of course, they'll probably have a red eye. The diagnostic uh, test of choice is the fluorescent stain. So this is what a, a fluorescent stain looks like. Um, there are these little swab sticks that you just put on the undersurface uh, of the conjunctiva and you have them kind of blink a few times. And if that staining goes into the abrasion, then that's a positive fluorescent uh, stain. Um, <clears throat> treatment, you can uh, do topical antibiotics for sure. Uh, they usually like uh, the ointments. So erythromycin ointment seems to be the ideal choice. The ointment just provides more of a relief for that graininess sensation and that foreign body sensation than the actual drops do. But if you know you can't get a hold of the erythromycin ointment, you can do these, these other drops. Small corneal abrasions will usually heal on this on, on their own, but if symptoms persist after a few days or up to a week, then it'd probably be worth getting in touch with ENT to talk about other forms of treatment options. All right, continuing with the eye. So how are we on time? All right, 
Um, I'll go a little faster. Sorry. <laughs> so many things. Um, so orbital uh, blowout fracture. This is definitely a uh, emergent, urgent uh, type of injury. Um, very the actual amount of times that you see an orbital blowout fracture about a third of the time will be due to sport participation and they'll involve this inferior orbital floor uh, floor so as you can see here this one is super severe the contents are all just kind of dipped down into the sinus compared to this side this is a very clear sinus um, <clears throat> the exam will be important to evaluate for extraocular movements because sometimes there can be trapping of the inferior rectus muscle. So when you have them look up, they will complain of like double vision. They can also um, have infraorbital nerve um, <clears throat> disruption. So they'll have some kind of numbness in their cheek area, and that can be uh, indicative of an orbital blowout fracture. CT is going to be your diagnostic image of choice and Again, for you, if you're doing this on the sideline, this doesn't um, isn't too pertinent. But if you're an ER physician or somebody that orders these, you'll want to get thin slices because uh, it can be missed if the th if the slices are too thick. Um, that was a insider uh, tip from an ophthalmologist I got one time. Um, usually, operative treatment will be required, and the return to play is going to be guided by ENT. So you'll definitely want to use a team based approach for that. Um, dental injuries, again, very common uh, in traumatic sports. Hockey seems to be the, the uh, sport of choice for, for teeth injuries. There are different, different classes depending on what's involved of the tooth. Class one, class two, class three. Class one being the um, least severe with class three being the most severe. Um, <clears throat> so with class one, you'll get uh, <clears throat> fracture of the enamel. So you'll still have essentially a white looking tooth with class two fractures that'll be involving the dentin and that will have pain associated with it. Class one usually isn't too painful um, post trauma, of course, and the tooth will appear yellow. And then class three is when you reach the pulp, which is this red uh, part of the tooth. So the tooth will appear red and it's super painful, very sensitive to cold, um, to heat, and that will definitely require an urgent dentist and uh, orthodontist evaluation. Um, oh, it didn't. Oh, there we go. Um, so uh, the other uh, dental injuries are these tooth avulsions. So when your tooth gets uh, pulled off or falls out of its socket, the save rate for these is actually quite low, surprisingly. Um, but if you kind of do appropriate management within 20 minutes, the save rate of the tooth can go up to about 90%. So what you'll want to do with these teeth is um, you'll want to promptly put them in saliva, uh, warm saline, or these uh, tooth saver uh, packets. Again, a lot of athletic trainers and um, physicians carry these in their pack because um, it's a common injury that, that we'll see. And <clears throat> that'll protect the, the tooth until it can have more definitive treatment. If you are going to uh, grab the tooth, make sure you're handling it by the uh, crown and not the root of the tooth, because then it can actually damage the root when they're trying to reimplant the tooth. You can put the tooth back into the socket, but that usually uh, can increase risk of like aspiration and swallowing the tooth, which which is definitely not uh, not great and can definitely lead to secondary issues. Um, for most of the avul's teeth with no chance of replantation, either they didn't notice that their tooth fell out or they just couldn't find the tooth, usually you can return to play within 48 hours, uh, definitely with mouth guard protection. And players who do have a reimplanted tooth should wait at least two to four weeks to return to play with uh, definitely a mouth guard and a face mask. So really quick, uh, I just wanted to talk about uh, some mouth guards. So this is your uh, stock mouth guard. This is essentially what you'll get just over the counter. Uh, you'll go to a, a local store and you'll just pick it up. And the, the way these work is you just literally put it in your mouth. There's no adjustment to it. There's no molding to it. These aren't great because one, they may not fit appropriately and they don't provide the, the, the best uh, protection. 
The other ones are these boil and bite or custom fitted mouth guards. So the boil and bite is uh, these material where you put them in hot water and they start to kind of soften up and then you bite into them and then they mold to the uh, to your teeth. Those are a little bit better, but when you actually bite into the mouth guard, they'll actually become super, they can become thin as you can kind of see in this part of the, the mouth guard and they're not very protective. For some reason, um, athletes really like these, just I think more of the convenient factor of them because they get lost very frequently. Um, so just caution athletes that um, when they are making the mold to maybe not bite down as hard or make sure they're centering the mouth guard appropriately to avoid thinning in certain areas. And then the custom mouth guard is going to be your mouth guard uh, of choice. This is either made by a professional dentist uh, or a dentist office, excuse me, and it's definitely more form fitted, provides the most protection, and it's it's kind of the best fitting and most comfortable. So, a little bit about mouth guards. I know it's not something that I kind of talk about too frequently. Um, man, my slides are all messed up. Um, so. Really quickly, throat injuries and some uh, jaw injuries. So throat injuries, that could be a whole lecture on its own. So I'm just going to give you some like basic overview for it. So uh, trauma in sport is is uncommon, but it's potentially life-threatening. There's been some stuff in the NHL or not NHL, um, in hockey leagues overseas where there have been some deaths that have occurred because of um, injuries to the neck from skates. So they're trying to make some rule changes that uh, protect uh, players. Um, <clears throat> baseball equipment now has a little neck protector that uh, wears for like catchers to try to prevent these throat injuries. So a lot of education, a lot of um, just unfortunate events have occurred that have made uh, some sports uh, some of these sports definitely safer, but again, uh, these injuries to the throat can pose risk to voice airway esophagus. They can have some hoarseness, dyspnea, hemoptysis, anything in the, uh, mediastinum can get injured. So anything injury wise to that area is obviously going to be, uh, a potential source of injury. Evaluation will include chest x-ray again, to evaluate for a, a pneumomediastinum, a CT will get better evaluation of the soft tissues and any sort of fractures, either to the hyoid um, or the, the trachea. And then you'll want to incorporate ENT for these because they, they will usually require a, a laryngoscope evaluation. Mild injuries, um, so just blunt force trauma, blunt force trauma, mild injuries, you can monitor just with close observation, vocal rest, anti-inflammatories, and then depending on ENT evaluation, serial endoscopies. But once they start feeling better and their respiratory uh, symptoms aren't compromised and their pain is well controlled, they usually can return to sport just, of course, with uh, protective equipment. Um, I put a little segment on uh, jaw dislocation because um, I saw this once in ER rotation. I thought it was kind of interesting. Um, it is something that you can encounter in sport. Um, but again, it's not super, super high yield, but I thought I would just incorporate it. So the, with jaw dislocation, it'll involve, again, trauma to the um, mandible. Prompt reduction uh, is usually indicated just once uh, it's been out of place for a certain amount of time. As with any other joint, you just get so much secondary muscle spasm that it's it's really hard and challenging to try to reduce reduce the jaw. Um, with any sort of dislocation, you'll want to get um, uh, post-reduction films. If you have the capability to do pre, then obviously pre. And if you feel any sort of crepitus or the, the jaw just isn't going back into place, then obviously you don't want to continue to try to repeat the um, re reduction. So with reduction, you'll want to apply actually a pretty firm uh, downward or inferior pressure um, and uh, posterior pressure because the jaw usually dislocates anteriorly. And it actually takes quite a bit of force to, to get it back in, especially if they have these secondary uh, muscle spasms and you don't have them sedated. Um, once you get it reduced, return to play, 
uh, in a couple of weeks is, is appropriate, as long as it's a simple dislocation with no secondary fracture and uh, recommended mouth guard and, and or face mask, depending on their sport and ability to use a face mask. Once it's dislocated, it's at further risk of dislocation as with any joint. So um, repeat relocations will be easier um, if they are a repeat offender for this. There, uh, oh no, I didn't change that. Sorry. So there is this um, new uh, technique that was described in the literature. It's this extra oral technique where you actually push down on the uh, the uh, anterior coronoid process on one side and uh, on the other side, you kind of rotate it anteriorly, which once you rotate it anteriorly, that um, that side where you're pushing posterior pressure will actually relocate easier. Um, and then you just repeat it for the other side. Um, I have a, a video. I don't know if, uh, I can pull it up here. Let me, sorry, share my screen again. Can you see the video? One click. Now we're going to do the other side. Oh. Just going to try to. There it so is. You can kind of see how it self reduced. Boom. And the patient is super is. happy after the fact. Boom. Um, I don't know any of the clinical history for, for that patient. They could have been a repeat offender. Um, but uh, again, the literature, at least for that specific uh, technique, they said that they actually uh, have a 100% success rate. So um, the also secondary advantage to that is that you don't have to put your hands uh, inside the mouth, which when you're reducing the jaw, you have risk of the patient actually biting you um, as, a, as a provider. And then, you know, you have to go through all that, that stuff. So uh, look up that technique, and uh, next time, if you're in the ER, you can try to practice it with, with a patient. Um, I added some miscellaneous stuff because I really didn't know where to incorporate this, but this is stuff that you'll see very commonly in sport, again, and general population. So uh, strep throat, very common. Um, <clears throat> diagnostic choice will be usually a point-of-care rapid strep test. Uh, amoxicillin is your drug of choice. And uh, recurrent infections usually will benefit from tonsillectomy. Again, you really want to time that with uh, the time of season that the athlete is in. Definitely don't want to do it during the season because um, then they'll obviously miss time and uh, you know not not great for for in season uh, timing. Uh, enlarged tonsils, just secondary to just their anatomy. Um, one of the most common uh, misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed conditions is obstructive sleep apnea. And we know in sport that if you have poor sleep quality, that leads to poor recovery, increased risk of injury. So if you see a patient and they have enlarged tonsils, highly recommend them getting sleep study um, to make sure they don't have obstructive sleep apnea and would benefit from a tonsillectomy maybe in the off season. Um, you can manage some of these symptoms with, uh, again, intranasal corticosteroids or oral antihistamines to try to prevent um, the sinus or the uh, tonsils to uh, grow from their baseline size. Um, sinusitis, uh, very common. Uh, usually it's viral and etiology. If symptoms persist over about five days, then antibiotics uh, can be indicated with amoxicillin. Um, again, try to prevent uh, these issues with intranasal corticosteroids. That's your first line treatment for any sort of allergic rhinitis. And then oral antihistamine uh, can be your second, uh, uh, an additional agent for that. Um, so in summary, uh, again, HEENT problems, super common in sport, really try to become familiar with conditions. This by no means was an extensive list. Um, so um, go back and look at, you know, each component and uh, really try to familiarize yourself with the anatomy and the different pathologies that can occur it's going to be super important to have a team-based approach. So um, having a dentist uh, on your staff that you can contact for questions and ENT, plastic surgeon, that is, uh, again, with sports medicine, team-based approach is, is, uh, is how we, I think, uh, should treat most of our patients because um, uh, 
uh, without a team, uh, we are we are no one. Um, <clears throat> and of course, with uh, any sort of uh, facial injury, you'll definitely want to rule out secondary injuries or more significant life-threatening injuries and definitely have an emergency action plan in place and practice this routinely because um, you'll never know when you're actually going to uh, need to utilize it and you want to make sure everybody's on board and uh, understands their role. Uh, Preseason education, I think, is also an important thing to incorporate. So uh, if you have, you know, wrestling or combat sports or football or hockey, trying to incorporate or uh, really educate them on equipment to try to prevent these issues, um, swimming with the the masks or the uh, caps and the the plugs, I think also would be uh, important to, to discuss with them. So um, definitely education. Um, so that's all I had. I think I try to stay on time. Um, so thanks again, uh, Matt and uh, AMSSM and Andy for allowing me to do this. This is my email in case anybody has any questions um, or uh, yeah, they just need anything from me. Happy to help uh, the, uh, the young uh, people as I was just there not too long ago. <laughs> thanks so much for that uh, great talk, Dr. Arsagera. I think Maybe let's, we've got time for maybe one question uh, that came up. And so it has to do with return to play uh, with infections, for instance. So um, for HENT infections like bacterial otitis or bacterial conjunctivitis, how do you guide return to play? Um, do you want them on antibiotics for a period of time, like skin infections, 72 hours, that type of thing? Do you follow neck check guidelines, i.e. if they have you know, systemic symptoms or symptoms below the neck, you pull them out until those resolve, or as long as, you know, it sticks, it remains rhinitis or just ear symptoms, are they okay to play as long as they're being treated? Is it case dependent? What do you think? Yeah, I think if, if you are convinced that they have a bacterial infection or that's confirmed, then at the minimum, you'd want them to be afebrile for um, 24 hours, um, definitely on antibiotic regimen. And as long as their symptoms are improving and they're on antibiotic regimen, um, I don't think that there's necessarily a reason to keep them out of sports. Um, they can, you know, do workouts. If it's something like viral conjunctivitis or something that's super contagious, then you obviously want to take the precautions with, you know, cleaning everything appropriately during workouts and stuff like that. But um, as long as they're, I think, on antibiotic regimen, if we think it's confirmed and uh, bacterial infection improving and afebrile, and they're otherwise feeling well, I don't think there's a reason to to keep them out of sport. Great. All right. Well, thank you again for the excellent discussion and for the support of AMSM's education and fellowship committees. We'll see everyone at the same time next week, and have a good night. Thanks, everybody.